Status check. Command on internal. Affirmative. Telemetry in large condition. Affirmative. Missile in internal DC. Affirmative. Pressurization complete. Affirmative. And all recorders in the telegraph to fast. Vernier start. Few events have captured our imaginations like the exploration of space. Hi, I'm Jim Lovell, former NASA astronaut, and if you're like me, you're probably standing in awe of the creativity of the people who put together a space launch. But I'll tell you something. Many of the principles of planning and organizing and executing a launch are put to use by you every day as a manager of McDonald's. And you may not believe it, but getting a worldwide company like McDonald's flying can be as challenging as sending a rocket to the moon. And you'd be surprised how important you are to that operation. McDonald's. It's a name that means a lot to people all over the world. We've built a reputation on quality food, fast service, consistency, and cleanliness. And your role as manager is summed up in a two-step process we employ for ensuring that quality, service, and cleanliness are maintained. The two steps are observation and action. And to do these effectively begins and ends with a concept we call floor control. Floor control? Why, there's nothing more important. If I don't have the right people and product in the right places at the right time, well, I just can't give our customers what they deserve. And any breakdown in the flow at any station can send shockwaves all the way from the grill area to the lobby. Cheryl, could you come here, please, and take over this register? How do I do it? Well, it's all pretty well planned for me for the use of my checklist and to-do list. But believe me, there's a lot more to it than anyone can list. It's all yours. Hi, may I help you, please? Hey, hiya, Jim. How you doing? Good, Bill. Boy, this place is really jumping today. Yeah, about right for this time of day. You know, I'm continually amazed how you coordinate all these systems and, uh, and still put out such a quality product. <laughs> That's quite a compliment coming from a guy like you. Well, I'm still impressed on how you pull it all together. Uh, how do you do it? Do you really want to know? Well, if, if you have the time. Well, it should be slowing down in a few minutes. I'll put Sandy in charge. Listen, why don't you go enjoy your lunch and then come on back. I'll show you how we put it all together. Fine, we'll do that. See you later. Right. Well, Jim, it all begins with a plan, consisting of a checklist, a to-do list, and a travel path. They provide a step-by-step -step method by which we plan and prepare our workday. I took part in four missions, so I know exactly how important those plans are. Our space flights must be programmed literally to the second. And for the most part, all aspects of a flight are controlled by computer programs. Oh, yeah, Jim, but you don't really think that our lists are as important as your programs, do you? Bill, there's a lot of difference between a space launch and a McDonald's, no doubt about it. But you'd be surprised how important proper planning is to both endeavors. How about if I take a look at that? Oh, sure. The floor control this system our, developed uh, by McDonald's provides you with a step-by-step -step -step system for the preparation of your store's workday. And it has 19 points. Proper utilization of these items allows you to place into motion the first of our two-step floor control process. Observation. And quantity. I use my checklist as a guide when I inspect the area around my store. The parking lot and corral, the back room, the service area and lobby, and of course, the dining area. I'm looking for trash, debris, broken equipment, anything which may detract from our quality, service, or cleanliness. That includes people and products, too. In my observations, I need to know who is scheduled to work and where would be the best place to position them. I also use the list to check product, food, raw products, paper. Do I have enough? Is all the equipment turned on and in good working order? Are the utensils in place? The checklist is really only a reminder of everything that must be checked before your shift begins. You are, of course, observing to make certain that McDonald's standards in several critical areas are being met. This program is not designed to educate you about these standards. 
Your McDonald's operation and training manual is your source for that information. To supplement this checklist, I also use my to-do list. In my checklist observations, I'll find areas which may require some action on my part. If I can correct the problem right away, I do. If I can't, I make a note of it on my to-do list and get it squared away as soon as I can. You mean things like fixing a machine or a broken window? Well, those are the most obvious. But I also need to look at the people's schedule, you know, see if I have enough in the right group for what we expect in sales. Otherwise, I really have to scramble. Well, it sounds to me like having all of your systems in a, uh, in a go mode before you open the doors. Well, when you put it that way, I guess I'd really have to agree. Well, could you meet the demands of your customers without a checklist or a to-do list? Hmm. Well, in fact, I'm sure I couldn't. Well, I remember I came in to open the store on a Sunday. I was making my rounds when I discovered that the walk-in refrigerator had gone out overnight. To compound things, the faucet in the men's washroom was broken. Plus, I had two new crew you people coming on during the first shift. If I hadn't used my checklist, I may not have discovered any of these problems. You sure don't need those kind of problems before you even get started. Mm -hmm. How did you manage it? Well, Jim, we have a system which provides four criteria which we apply to every problem. Bill's answers to these problems bring into play our second step in the floor control process. We've already shown you how important observation is. Now it's time to examine action. But before we examine precisely which action Bill took to solve his problems, we're going to give you an opportunity to react to the same situation. Remember, Bill was confronted with three problems. A broken faucet in the washroom, a breakdown of his walk-in refrigerator, and two inexperienced crew personnel. Also, keep in mind that Bill's particular problems occurred before his store opened for its day's business. Nonetheless, it was imperative that he act as soon as possible to rectify these situations. At McDonald's, we've devised a simple formula for dealing with nearly every floor control challenge. This formula is comprised of four criteria that must be applied to every situation. These criteria are stated in the form of questions. Is there a performance discrepancy? Does it have direct or indirect effect on our customers? What is the degree of direct effect? What is the priority of indirect effect? Performance discrepancies, quite simply, are any occurrences that deviate from McDonald's standards. The difference between what should be and what is. These discrepancies can include problems in food quality, service to customers, or incidents that may hinder the profitable operation of the store. A performance discrepancy may have a direct or indirect effect on our customers. If an equipment failure, for example, slows down the service or causes the improper preparation of food, our customers will be directly affected. On the other hand, a messy back room or an unbalanced cash drawer does not have the same direct impact on our customers. The challenge facing the McDonald's manager is to distinguish between direct and indirect effects and act first on those that impact our customers. This in no way diminishes the importance of indirect effects. Rather, it provides a system of prioritizing that allows you to make intelligent responses to two or more situations occurring at the same time. We have developed, therefore, our third criterion, degree of direct effect, to help you prioritize those performance discrepancies that directly impact our customers. We classify degrees of direct effect into three categories. First degree of direct effect refers to any situation that directly impedes delivery of products to the customer. Second degree of direct effect refers to any situation that inhibits the comfort or convenience of our customers. Third degree of direct effect refers to any situation that affects the appearance or function of a store without impeding the sale of products or affecting the comfort or convenience of customers. First degree of direct effect problems should always be tended to first, then second, then third degree. Direct effect problems must always be addressed as soon as possible, regardless of degree. Indirect effect discrepancies, however, do not always require immediate response. They should be solved in the course of your daily business preparation. However, you must also apply a system of prioritizing these indirect effects. A decision must be made about indirect effects, those which must be done immediately, 
Those that can be put off for several hours or those that can be put off for a day or more. Actions that must be completed immediately we classify as A priorities. Those that can be put off for several hours are B priorities. And those that can be put off for a day or more are C priorities. These criteria can and must be applied to every situation in which a decision or choice must be made, both for direct and indirect effects. Let's practice applying them to some specific situations. Open your workbook to Section 1. Follow the instructions carefully on that page. Now, stop the tape and complete the exercise. Now, let's apply what we've just learned to the situation confronting Bill at his store, beginning with the broken faucet. Ask the question, is it a performance discrepancy? The answer, of course, is yes. Second question, does it have direct or indirect effect on our customers? To those customers who will be using our washrooms, the answer, of course, is a direct effect. Third, what is the degree of effect? Does it prohibit the sale of our product? No. Does it inhibit the comfort or convenience of our customers? The answer here, of course, is yes. Now, let's apply the same criteria to the broken refrigerator. Again, it is a performance discrepancy. It has a direct effect on the customer. And it has the potential to be a first degree of effect. Food can be severely damaged in a very short period of time. Finally, let's consider the case of the two trainees. They pose a more unique problem. Ordinarily, the inclusion of two new people in a normal day's activity wouldn't necessarily have a direct effect on our customers. However, in this particular case, Bill is confronted with a dilemma. Each of these three situations requires prompt action on Bill's part. If he spends his time working with the new trainees, he won't have enough time to solve the walk-in refrigerator problem. And if he spends all morning working on the walk-in, who's going to fix the broken water faucet? And who's going to supervise the new trainees? Well, my biggest problem was the walk-in. I had to track down a repair person, and I had to do it fast. I knew that this could take up a lot of my time, time that could be spent training the two new crew members or fixing the faucet. So I delegated the authority to my assistant manager to work with the two new people. And I assigned one of the crew people to fix the faucet as soon as he came in in the morning. I spent a couple of hours getting the walk-in fixed. And somehow I made it without losing any product. I guess it just shows you how important detailed plans are. You just can't fly by the seat of your pants. You know, we operate the same way. In the original Apollo missions, there were initially three different flight plans. Uh, the first was a direct approach. The second plan was the Earth Orbital Rendezvous. The third plan was the Lunar Orbital Rendezvous, which was the one that was finally chosen. Any of them would have worked, but a decision had to be made as to which one was the best for that particular situation. Yes, but the planning is only part of the story. I mean, it helps get things going, not keeping them going. That's another story. I mean, that takes teamwork, everybody pulling together, coordination, you know, helping out and filling in. And a checklist is not going to help you there. Well, once again, Bill, we can draw a parallel between what it takes to make a McDonald's work and what it takes to pull off a successful space flight. You talk about teamwork. Well, look at the control center sometime. There are computer technicians, doctors, scientists, and, of course, we astronauts just pulling together, making everything work. Pulling together. That's the secret to success. And the manager's responsibilities of observation and action make it happen. A good manager is part psychologist. He or she must be constantly aware of the entire environment, listening to register conversations, understanding the strengths and weaknesses of the crew. A good manager is also an organizer, placing people, products, and equipment in the right place at the right time. A good manager is part teacher, helping new and experienced personnel to do their jobs better. And a good manager is a hard worker, rolling up his or her sleeves to dig in and get the job done. You know, Jim, there are 
Often come those times when the program just doesn't go as planned, and I have to make immediate decisions by myself. Boy, I know what you mean. Let me tell you a story. The project was Jimmy 12. Our mission to dock with an Agena target vehicle. Uh, Buzz Aldrin and I conducted what was considered to be a successful flight, but not before encountering some serious problems. The onboard computer, which uh, stored the computations we received from Earth, malfunctioned. We had to override the computer and manually provide it with the right answers. Now, we've been trained to do these things, but it just goes to show that no matter how elaborate the plans, something can go wrong. <laughs> Around here, it's more the rule than the exception. I remember a time, a busy lunch hour, no less, when our drive through window transmitter went I was checking it out when a customer complained about his drink being watered down. I checked, and he was right. Talk about putting things into manual operation. I wouldn't have the slightest idea what to do. Well, first I had to apply my four criteria, and then... Uh, one moment, please. Before Bill shows how he handled this problem, let's take a look at it ourselves. Turn your workbook to section two and stop the tape. Well, when I applied my four criteria, I determined that both were performance discrepancies and both directly affected the customers. However, the malfunction of the beverage system was a second degree of effect because the other side was still functioning, although service would be slowed somewhat. The broken transmitter was, in reality, a first degree effect. Hello? I had to figure out a way to provide the convenience of the window without a transmitter. So I stationed a crew person at the order board to take orders and went to work to see what was causing the malfunction in the beverage system. Pretty quick thinking on the fire, Bill, but it made a lot of sense. Uh, your approach was logical, you applied a system of troubleshooting, uh, your four criteria, and you acted. Yeah, all in about 20 seconds. Well, that's what being a manager in control is all about. Our astronauts have faced the same split-second decisions. Remember John Glenn? Oh, of course, he was the first American to orbit the Earth. Yes, but did you know he had to make a split-second decision just prior to re-entry? No, really? You bet. As he prepared to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, the automatic control system malfunctioned. Now, we're talking about re-entering the atmosphere at such speeds that an intense amount of heat builds up around the capsule. And every second those retro rockets delay in firing puts the capsule miles and miles off course. So you can see how important it is to be prepared for such an occurrence. Ooh, you mean he could have thumped down instead of splashed down? Possibly. He could have landed on dry surface or in unfriendly waters. Instead, he made a decision. Manually fired the retro rockets and made a successful landing. Off target, but safe. Brother, I can see how you astronauts really must be in control of your ships, huh? Just like you're in control here, Bill. We don't just go along for the ride. We're there to take over when the systems go haywire. Systems and people, too. You know, a big part of my job is making sure the right people are in the right places. Just as NASA handpicks his personnel based on their skills. Uh, some astronauts, like Glenn, Shepard, and I, were pilots. Others, like Jack Schmidt, were scientists. Uh, Joe Kerwin on Skylab was an MD. You know, we have a lady here, middle-aged, been with us uh, several years. She's good at the fry station, providing consistent product. She's also good at the register, has a good memory, is friendly. She's all of these, except when traffic is at its peak. I was using my observation checklist and noticed that she gets flustered, makes mistakes. Well, I hate to fire her, though, because she is good most of the time. So, uh, what did you do? Well, we'll pause here again to let you respond to this challenge. Open your books to section three and stop the tape. Her work, of course, affected our critical standards and could directly affect customers with either a first, second, or third degree of effect. My decision? Use her as a swing worker, putting her on lobby cleanup during peak periods and swinging her back to the grill or cash register when things settle down. Again, your observation, analysis, and action were based on those four important criteria. It seems they're the focal point of your management skills. If you become familiar with them, so familiar that you can instantly apply them to any situation, well, you can uh, see how any of those situations can be solved, but if you leave any of the criteria out, it won't work. Bill, it's repetition, going over again and again. You have to make it second nature. Now, when we prepared for a space flight, we went through exercises, both mental and physical, over and over. We drilled, drilled, and drilled, until our senses were finely tuned to just about any situation. But can you really cover every conceivable problem in your training? 
Of course not. Uh, but we learn to be aware, to make decisions, and to react. Really, that's all we can do, too. It's the most important part of our jobs. That's why we're called managers. Uh, the system already exists, Jim. It's just our job to make sure it works the way it's supposed to. We can't let circumstances affect us. We have to affect them. That's what our job is all about. And ours. I'll give you an example. A story about an incident in a mission which could have been fatal. Apollo 13. But we were 200,000 miles out, some 56 hours into the flight. Faulty wiring in an oxygen tank thermostat caused a short, which ruptured the tank. The oxygen was being used to mix with hydrogen for the ship's electrical power. And although the main tank blew, we had a backup system. The oxygen from the ruptured tank flashed into a gas, blew out the side of the spacecraft and ruptured the second tank. We suddenly found ourselves 200,000 miles away from home with no electrical power. Oh my gosh, Jim, what did you do? Well, fortunately, the lunar landing module was attached to the main craft, and it had its own electrical system. Now, we maneuvered the craft through that system. Thank goodness for the lunar module, huh? And your training. Exactly. When things don't go as planned, you have to take charge. I'll tell you, it happens here all the time, Jim. Once I was following my bin chart religiously, but waste at certain times seemed to be higher than at other times. According to the charts, well, that shouldn't have been happening. There was a problem somewhere in the system? Mm -hmm, and I had to find it. But again, I had my plan. Here's another problem for you to attack before Bill shows you how he handled it. Turn to section four and stop the tape. I looked into the problem and discovered that the waste seemed to occur at the same time every day. I made the decision to alter the bin chart and keep a close eye on the product during these times. The result? A great reduction in waste and an increase in profitability. Profitability. Well, that's how success is measured at McDonald's. Mm. But NASA measures the success by reaching each mission's goal. But the challenges are, in principle, the same. Sure. They involve people, products, equipment. Plans, preparation. And decisions, Jim. And it all means one thing, better service for your customers, Bill. <laughs> exactly right. You know, when you break it down, floor control touches every aspect of a McDonald's operation. Quality of product, service, and cleanliness. And floor control happens all the time, not just when we're busy. In fact, it seems that sometimes we have the best service when we're the most busy. It's when things slow down a bit that I have to be most conscious of potential problems. But it certainly must be easier to spot problems and solve them at slower periods. Not necessarily, Jim. I remember a service problem we had once. I was scheduling people for breaks after peak periods when things slowed down. It seemed like a logical thing to do. I just moved people around to fill in the gaps. Everything seemed to be so logically planned out. But then I started noticing things, subtle things. Lines started building up and counter people were waiting for product. It dawned on me that my plan had backfired. I had too many people on break. Yet I had to give everybody a rest. When could I do it other than at slower times? But if I did, how could I continue to give good service? That's a good question and a common problem. How would you handle it? Stop the tape and turn the workbook to section five. First, I had to jump in and help out on the grill. Then I had to look more closely at my schedule, make scheduling changes, and keep my eyes open for any lull in the business so that I could schedule only one or two people on break at one time. I had to put into action my observation skills. I couldn't allow them to slack off when business did. I see what you mean. I mean Essentially, this is the crux right. of floor control. Right. Your ability to observe potential problems and act on them before they become real problems. We had another unique floor control problem one time, Jim. A girl was working the number two register. In my normal course of observation, I noticed that she had rung up an order for one quarter, but there were two on the tray. Well, at first, I dismissed it because we were so busy at the time. But the more I thought about it, the more I became suspicious. The customer was a friend of hers. I knew that much. I'd seen them together outside of work, and we'd been having some problems with theft. A touch your area, I'm sure. Mm. Say, Luann, could you get us a couple of black coffees, please? Sure. Thanks. Ah, nonetheless, I had to do something about it. To do something. Yes, that is the most important role of the manager. How would you handle this challenge? 
turn to section six and stop the tape. Well, did you confront her on the spot? Yes, again, I applied my criteria. In doing so, I determined that this action was a performance discrepancy, but one that did not directly affect the customer. Nonetheless, it was an a priority, Jim, something which had to be answered immediately. But uh, didn't you risk disrupting workflow? Yes, but I was locked into a legal situation. If I didn't confront her at the time of the crime, our case could be weakened. I can see that by waiting, you'd imply that the problem wasn't very serious. Right, but my system of prioritizing made my decision easier. Once again, the process of criteria is applied, and the problem is solved. You have to maneuver your actions, the people involved, and the product around the situation at hand, bringing things together to make things work. It's a delicate science, I know. Don't forget it was Frank Borman and I who took Gemini 7 to the first manned space rendezvous with another craft. Our ship approached within the one foot of Gemini 6, 185 miles above the Earth. And we flew in close formation for nearly eight hours. Both spacecraft splashed down the Atlantic within 10 miles of the predicted impact zone. That's astounding. It's people, products, and equipment synchronized together, just like in your store. Hmm, planned and prepared. But did you ever have uh, outside forces other than equipment failures interfere with your work? You bet. Weather in particular. Many missions were delayed because of weather and, and other problems. Why, well, look at the first space shuttle. It was delayed for several days because of a combination of computer problems and bad weather. But as we all know, it too became an unqualified success. <laughs> weather affects us too. My ultimate responsibility is to make my store as profitable as possible. If I schedule a crew based on expected business and the weather wipes out that business, well, then I have to make a decision about sending people home. That's a big part of floor control, too, Jim. Do the customers themselves ever affect floor control? Oh, yes, people who complain about the food, for example. But they're the easy ones to satisfy. I mean, if they don't like the product, we just exchange it. Sometimes other mistakes occur, though, which disrupt the flow. Like what, Bill? Well, like just the other day. A customer complained he was short-changed. That could be a real problem, especially when things are busy. Mm -hmm. But it demands immediate attention. What type of immediate attention? You tell us. Turn to Section 7 and stop the tape. He had just been served, so I asked him to have a seat and enjoy his meal. This gave me time to pull the drawer, check it out, and take care of our customer. Of course, it did disturb the pace of the operation, didn't it? Oh, no, not as much as if I would have argued or neglected to rectify the situation. <laughs> Listen, you understand the criteria by now, Jim. Think what would have happened if I hadn't applied them. <laughs> you wouldn't have solved the problem. Mm -hmm. Solving problems is what my job is all about. Oh, and speaking of my job, maybe I should get back to it, huh? <laughs> Floor control. Yet, it's problem solving plus problem prevention. As we've stated, there's no way to define all of the potential situations that can arise in the day-to-day -day operation of any McDonald's store. A space launch can be programmed for many variations, but there is no computer complex enough to store even a fraction of the possibilities that might arise at one of our restaurants. This is why we hope that the exercises you've been through today help you understand two basic concepts of floor control. Number one, planning. Use your checklist, to-do sheets, and travel paths every day. You'll eliminate many problems before they occur, and you'll keep your operation running with teamwork, coordination, enthusiasm, and productivity. And number two, use the four criteria and the three degrees of effect and prioritizing to analyze a problem when it does come up. They'll apply in some way each and every time something out of the ordinary occurs. Of course, we want you to be more than just a firefighter. You must make a decision at the time of the occurrence, a decision that quickly and effectively solves the problem. But more important, you must also make a note to yourself to identify where your system is breaking down. Where is the real problem? Does it run deeper than the occurrence itself? If so, what can you do to eliminate it from ever occurring again? This is the key to floor control. It is the key 
to being a successful McDonald's manager. Whether it's floor control or mission control, the challenge is the same, success. The same principles of preparation, observation, and action apply. But you're the command pilot. Although you have a team behind you, when it comes to the countdown to profitability, it is you that has to make it fly.